Yes, I agree with Pip about the demands. That's where we should start. Clear demands, keep the coal in the ground, keep the gas in the ground and cut the fossil fuel subsidies. But Naomi Klein's book, especially her title, This Changes Everything, gets the wind up a lot of people. They think, what? Everything? Our whole society? Do you mean we have to change everything? Shopping. Shopping. Everything. So it's very alarming for a lot of people that, and I think maybe she did that deliberately. And I want to talk on the cultural level because it's a, that's what she says has to change, the ideas. Peter asked me to tell you a bit about my experiences doing radio. So how did I get to do radio? Well, my first contact was with the um, climate movement in that dingy room at UTS where a lot of campaigns are hatched. Um, I think Simon was there, um, certainly Kamala Emanuel was there. And we had several meetings, these main peak groups all together, people very self-consciously in groups like Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth and um, Wilderness and all of those people got together. But it didn't really cohere very well because there wasn't anything I think they shared in the way of values and so they were all posturing a bit as important people. And I went along, I was new in that, and I went along to some marches, there were rallies and so on. It didn't seem to click really much and then I got sucked into their projects and I remember being dressed up in a Greenpeace polar bear suit which was for a six foot ten man and it sort of squashed out with me with all these extra bits of fur around my ankles and I was handing out leaflets at town hall and handing out leaflets and would you like one sir and this is about climate change it's very important and really the dead reaction I got except for Japanese tourists who wanted to put their arms around me and have a photo taken <laughs> And we dramatised, you know, ice flows melting and all of this and the polar bears expiring. It didn't seem to do anything. So I gave up that. And then I got involved with Beyond Zero Emissions and they were much more hard-headed. They weren't my f type either, really. They were all kind of engineers and uh, raving about wind turbines and inverters and things that I really couldn't think about. But they were publishing about that. So they said to me, look, could you get into our radio program? And they more as parachuted me into it. And from one day, I was interviewing Clive Hamilton just as a sort of tester and just talking about his book. Next day, it was my program. And I was doing it every week. It's been an amazing experience for me because it means I meet people that I would never have met before. And I really adore them. I don't in interview any deniers or any people I don't. I like all the people I interview and I admire them and yet uh, we're all coming from different points of the compass and these are the people that Pip's talking, these activists, country people, I love them very much too and I've been up camping and you sort of unzip the tent and there's this gorgeous scenery all around you like Switzerland and down the road these people are planning to frack this, you know, I, even I can see this is absolutely prime agricultural land um, and the people there welcome you so much. Um, I've had some problems with this, I interview them, I put everything on air but I feel there's, a, again, this level of values. They don't value community radio. I don't think they'd value Green Left Weekly. I don't think they'd value, you know, sort of alternatives in things because if, if they get five seconds with Alan Jones, they'll put that up on their website, you know, click on Alan Jones talking to someone. If I do 15 minutes of really in-depth interview, they forget to put it on their web page. So I sort of think there's a problem there of not valuing. This takes me to another aspect I think the media, the alternative media isn't really valued. I was at the Writers Festival and Rachel was there selling the Green Left Weekly outside. All the bourgeoisie of Sydney went in to hear Robert Mann and to hear Anthony Lowenstein. I got there late, I couldn't go in and it was being broadcast. And Rachel was there selling the Green Left Weekly and then I heard loud and clear from the big broadcast, Anthony Lowenstein, who's written a book on left wing something, said there is no left wing media in Australia. And then all the bourgeoisie came out, Rachel again, would you like Green Left Weekly? <laughs> no, they just didn't, they didn't recognise it. They must have thought it was a fashion magazine or something. They didn't get it. So I think there's a problem there and I think that activists need to start <laughs> reaching out a bit more and kind of challenging the media that we've got. Stephen, my husband, he rings up the ABC every day. He's got something to challenge them about. And he, he must, you know, they must dread his calls. He challenges them on the refugee policy. He, cha he always challenging them. He suggests other people they could interview instead of the ones they've already got tamed. But no, I, I think I admire him for doing it because I think that must ripple effect in the, in the ABC. But there's other 
programs you could phone up, there's other media outlets you could get into. And I think there's some problem here with these activists who are, we are reporting on. I would like them to have some solidarity with us. And, you know, I really would like these people I interviewed to put my interview with them on their webpage if they're not going to put my interview with you on their webpage. But, you know, why don't they? And I think we could eventually talk to them because we've done all this country and city united we stand protect our water protect our land i've been very emotional about that and followed that but i think they tend to just sort of think it's all about their local impact and they're not thinking about climate change this is what naomi klein wants us to lift the culture so that everybody it's for everybody it affects everybody of course if the liverpool plains is mined our food bowl is destroyed of course that's obviously locally very threatening for them. Of course, if Newcastle coal loader expands, more train lines of coal go past the children, the asthma rate goes up. I've interviewed doctors, I've interviewed teachers, I've, you know, I've interviewed a lot of them. The local impacts are huge, but we need to now lift that and say, it's not just local impacts, it's global impacts. I think the problem is lack of internationalism as well. People don't get an international perspective. I haven't traveled for 30 years because I wasn't taking a plane anymore after having spent a long time in South America and so on. But I did recently go to Timor and to Laos. And in both of those countries, there's a massive need. They don't have the money to, you know, uh, protect against climate change, to I fix up their, um, their infrastructure, their roads in Timor. It's impossible to travel in lots of places. You can't travel. And, and the radio, I, radio company I'm with, Radio 3CR, they've actually gone and trained people in Timor so that they can at least reach isolated places by radio. But I sort of feel the lack of real knowledge of what it is. I've, I've seen there in Timor the deforestation when the, um, you know, the uh, Indonesians were there, that they deforested a lot of that land, hasn't regrown. Um, defoliated and so to flush out the uh, fighters. But uh, they haven't reforested that. And I said to people, well, you know, I'm sh I, I spoke to the Minister of Agriculture and he said, oh, we're trying, but it's a losing battle because we still have slash and burn here. We still have people needing the wood for fires. We still need, need the wood. Uh, we can't reforest. The mangroves the same. They, they have massive storms. The mangroves are not there any longer to protect them. And I just feel, like I try and tell these stories on the radio, but I just feel we need to pester the mainstream media to do that job. I might feel it's the heavy lifting should not be with the alternative groups anymore. You know, the, these stories, that's where you'll get the collective feeling when you get those stories. I remember on one TV show, um, I did happen to see probably Dateline, was a woman in doctor in Pakistan during the last heat wave. And I've done a lot of programs on heat waves. I've interviewed so many doctors about it because that's one of the climate changing impacts the health system really will suddenly not be able to cope with. You know, we, there's lots of other, the on dengue fever and malaria will increase and there'll be, you know, accidental deaths and all of that. But the heat waves are a quick, sudden stress to the medical system that medical systems can't cope with. And this doctor, she just looked at the TV and she said, oh yes, she said, we, we're we being overwhelmed. We're getting a thousand people a day. We uh, we usually only get 500. Um, it was more than that. I forget the numbers. But then she said, we have a frig refrigerated truck out the back at the hospital because our morgue is overflowing. We couldn't cope. So this is the shape of it. And as Simon said with the reaction to refugees, you only have to look at our hard policy to see how Policies are going to harden up instead of accommodate the crisis. And it's so bestial not to accommodate a crisis. Look at the wartime stories. People always refer to the Second World War with victory gardens. I think Britain had 47% of its food supplied at home. They were still waiting for shipments over for the you know, last few 50% or so, but they were able to provide for their own food. They uh, turned, in America, they turned around the motor automobile factories into armaments. So it can be done. Look at the 2008 financial crisis. Trillions <coughs> were found, just like that. The banks were too big to fail. They just found the trillions. We need to somehow get the climate to look like that, the climate crisis in our culture, in our cultural speaking, in our media, to look like that. So that that Pakistani doctor, it's, it's not going to be just every year worse for her, and for us, 
it's going to start being, okay, we're going to see a peaking of this. I would like climate targets, all these stupid targets we've bandied about ever since the first meeting. I went and I went off and did polar bears and all that. that those meetings, we, we haggled over the targets as if, oh, 20%, oh, no, can we do 21%, oh, green business, 24%, oh, no, da, da. That's ridiculous. It should be 100% now. Mm -hmm. And what are we going to do for next year? What are you going to, what is our government or any other government going to dish up for us next year? I would like to see it going down. Have you been to those meetings where you see those graphs? They all go up on every indicator. They just keep going up. Some of them go like that, gradual, 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 and then they go up like that. It's really shocking. I go to all those meetings, four degrees of warming, six degrees of warming. That's the trajectory. Mm. And so our people who have been paid to, you know, sit in Parliament, they can't be permitted to have that degree of ignorance and it should be on their mind all the time. Okay, a bit more of my experience interviewing people. I <coughs> interviewed these um, coal groups. I went to Bolga where Rio Tinto is um, encroaching and I stayed with a family there overnight because they put me up. It was a planning meeting and I'd say 90% of the people there were against Rio Tinto expanding its mine. Out of that 90%, 1% gave the reason as climate change. They used all the reasons about um, you know, local health impacts, migratory birds being put out, um, and Aboriginal sacred sites being uh, moved. And I didn't, note, I didn't take that in so much about the Aboriginal sacred sites, but I think as Pip mentioned that, you know, respect to the elders here, we should know what that, these mining projects involve for those people. Because I stayed overnight with the local historian, he and his wife, and we sat up till midnight, past midnight talking, and he showed me all his books about the local history. And in that place where Bolga, where Rio Tinto is expanding in a sort of Grand Canyon-like fashion, the local Aboriginal people only six, oh no, in the 1860s, how long ago is that? You know, 1860s were there and they had the Bora Ring ceremonies there. So six or seven hundred Aboriginal people would come there. It was like Stonehenge, you can imagine, would be in sacred site, that place. And what is left, some stone memorials and some stone things are there and artefacts were gathered by Rio Tinto and put in a shed. So it's in like a tool shed somewhere. And they said, no, we've, we're going to relocate the, you know, the sacred site elements and off site. It's like the koalas, they're going to take off the uh, Liverpool Plains and just put on another forest somewhere. Koalas will rebel, I think. <laughs> but the, the Aboriginal people there spoke up at that, at that forum and I, I listened to that. But the one thing I noticed is that climate is not the, the key element there. I went also to a Shenhua versus Liverpool Plains meeting last Saturday and the farmers there all talking about the food bowl, we all understand that we all eat the food we need them to, to preserve their land. But then I asked the question, this was very controlled, you know, you had to write your question on a piece of paper, so I submitted, my, I submitted two pieces of paper, but they were both about climate change and she sort of, the organiser homogenised that down into a little bland, sort of not very political question. And when she put it to the farmers from the Liverpool Plains, oh, now she said, we've got a question about climate change, you know, half smiling. And he said, whoa, whoa, won't go there. So what's going on? You know, we're the allies of these people. I think they should be the allies of us too. It's like the bourgeoisie who heard walk past Rachel waving the green left weekly. I think they should say, hang on, you know, you're there and you're doing something. That's quite interesting what you're doing. Tell me about it. Let us, let us um, add your demand to our demand. You can save the Liverpool Plains and you can work on the climate. I, I find that very poor and that's one of these cultural um, sticking points that I m makes me feel it's rather shallow movement. I would like it to be stronger and more, as I said, more international, more our eyes on mm -hmm. Timor, our eyes on Pakistan, our eyes on where the problems are. Okay, so that was my some of my bulga and... Um, you know, mining stories. The other thing I've learnt about with the media is you have to frame it. People have all over the last few years have told me, oh, you frame, need to frame it differently. Frame it through a health frame. Th frame it through a positive frame. Then David Spratt says, don't frame it through a positive frame. Frame it with as much gloom and doom and dire warnings as you can. I'm a bit confused. I'm not sure. I naturally am positive, so I try to 
you know, lift it up at the end. I don't want to leave the people not being activ activists. I want to activate them so that I always have some campaigning things at the end of the session of the broadcast. But I tried framing it with the health frame and I found that the heat stress angle is the one that really gets people. I've had firemen, ambulance men reading out the list of people they went to, you know, just people expiring from the heat. Figures that we're actually talking about are in the tens of thousands. Yes. They're not single thousands. No, they're I know. Tens of thousands. That's yeah. right. And the, and so the ambulance this is just like Victorian ambulance on a day of heat stress. You think Victorians would get enough messages from the TV or the radio, but they hadn't. And sort of 80 year old man playing golf in maximum temperature day. So he expired. Then I had Dr. Hannah who said, well, just take as your example um, Dubai or anywhere in the Middle East where they're building cities. Some parts they're building these mega cities, maximum air conditioning, maximum sort of fake grass, swimming pools, artificial everything. That's right. But and, and it, it's mega carbon intensive. You know, it's all it's not. Some, some parts of it are renewable energy, but it's mega intensive. It's, she said, that's not sustainable. And she said, but what I want to report to you is the workers there. They die. Average age of those workers is 45 when they die. And I said, what did they die from? She said, kidney failure. They just get dehydrated working in those conditions. So there's another example. I had another woman, um, she wrote an article in The Big Issue, which is another alternative paper that I think is very good. They have very good journalism. Um, so, you know, get the climate story into big issue if, if you can. They um, wrote one, woman wrote a story about her, her sister had died uh, in heat stress and she broke down on telling the story on the radio and I put some music on and rushed out and got her a glass of water and I said, do you want to go on? Uh, I'll, I'll change the subject. No, she said, I want to go on. It's an important story to tell. And it was about her sister who'd had a mental illness and the their partner had a mental illness too and they'd become very paranoid about going out of their house. And the, the family rang them and checked on them a little bit and they had carers who came to see them but somehow they slipped through the cracks and they both died. And when she thought of that and she remembered that, you're in Melbourne and you know every, every service is laid on compared to you know poorer countries but they did, still died and she said we have to be much more you know, the whole society needs to get on, so, uh, on side this and know these stories and, and put in place preventative action. So I, that's why I think it's definitely what Pip said. You don't just turn up at a rally or advise someone to come to a rally. People need to be permanent activists on this, whether it's, you know, getting the public housing people to m make their houses more, not where you're going to fry in there, in the heat, or um, to get places open in the city you know, where people can stay on an on a extremely hot day, just quiet places. It, it, there's a, lo a lot needs to be done and every, every society needs to be more resilient, but much more, as Naomi Klein says, we need to do a massive transfer of um, money and expertise to countries who can't afford it to get them up to a sort of, um, at least protect themselves, you know, early warning systems the cyclones and but also the protection uh, uh, that you need so these are things I've learned just from talking to all these different people um, the last one is so the health frame was one that I've found people are interested in and it, it seems to get through to everyone because everyone knows what it would be like to die of heat stroke you can imagine it it's we all know what it's, that's like the feeling the other aspect has been the law now I've been to lots of court cases one was um, rising tide up in Newcastle and the people there they they locked on to the coal loader and all the case was what had they disturbed the business model of the coal loader company no that's what they took them to court you destroyed our, our business and the judge was on their side I think because she teased it out and over about three days I think three weeks I think I went back twice to hear the whole story and it was this elaborate story of the coal industry how how they do all these all sorts of actions and and these people strapped on caused them to ha you have to get a cherry picker and get them off and that was inconvenient but but it was they were trying to prove that their business was interrupted and she pr she said to them in fact i can prove to you she looked through all their accountants all their statements and everything and she said they hadn't their business hadn't they hadn't lost a dollar <laughs> after all of that and i was sitting in the court with all of these executives of the of the coal loader company and i thought like i don't hate them i don't want to make enemies of them i would just like to have a 
overarching government that was savvy and clever like like you have in Europe now, in Germany or somewhere, you know, we, you just redeploy these people. Because they were so clever the way they described every last bit of the coal loader, how it works. They, they, they've got expertise. I felt like going up to them and saying, oh, I did try to talk to one of them, but he obviously thought I was a bit too alternative. He didn't really want to talk to me. But I said to him, well, you, you, you could run a sort of export industry of, of solar energy from Darwin, couldn't you? It could be just as good. You, you could have just as much money and just as much business and all your expertise, you know. You, you obviously know how to run things like that. So I thought, that's the, the sort of reflections. You might think it's a bit eccentric, but I'm sitting in court looking at these people thinking, are they really an enemy or are they just mad keen on getting this business working properly and making those profits? Couldn't they be making profits doing something else? And it's just the culture that's got to shift them and shift the workers so the workers are not left behind because that's the other story of the workers being left behind. And to finish with, a, a happy story. Um, shall I tell the one about the psychopaths? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is the. My, I'll leave my happy one for the very end. This is the one of the New South Wales Parliament. I, 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 I wanted. Yes, I wanted. I wanted to tell you about. I've sat in law courts, planning hearings, and Parliament quite a few times. And I went to the New South Wales Parliament. Pip mentioned the bill. It was narrowly lost about a moratorium. Just a moratorium. Not let's stop coal seam gas. Just a moratorium on it. And you saw, if Pip was there, I think Pip and, the, and I were the only people who you might call media there. I don't know where the mainstream media were. It wasn't an interesting story for them. I thought it was fascinating because this min uh, honourable Mr. Dr. Peter Phelps, everyone subsequently has told him he's, me he's um, notorious, but I didn't know that. And he got up and he looked at the gallery, the public gallery, and said the real tragedy is that there's a triangular sort of thing going on here and at the bottom are people like you, the activists and the community organisers and you are, you know, innocent but misguided. You don't understand about coal seam gas, i.e. it's completely harmless and we've done every proof and test on it. No, it's completely harmless. It's, you know, they're misguided but above that there's another layer of activists and socialists and <laughs> psychopaths and suckers <laughs> and at the top of the pyramid are the Marxists and the Greens yeah. and, he, and that's I, I'm only I'm only summarizing watermelons was the name of his book that's right yeah. he'd been and, and someone interjected no the ALP interjected and said he'd gone beyond the bounds and the audience in the public gallery were only going oh really oh a bit like that not very loud I would, wouldn't have shouted out I felt very constrained in there and I think I was sitting next to someone from Santos anyway, so I didn't feel very comfortable. <laughs> but the, he said, um, he, he went on after, he said, no, I've read about it in a book called My Watermelon, you know, and, and it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a conspiracy, it's, this is how it's working. And these people are trying to stop business. But it's not so funny, it's, it's now replicated with George Brandis, you know, putting a, a, a codicil into the... Um, Environment Protection Act so that community groups can't protest and if that gets through, it's probably in a committee at the moment, but if that gets through, then people like ourselves will be, you know, absolutely hamstrung. So that's my not very, not very uh, happy story, but my last one is a happy story from um, a person I met um, who was a lawyer in Holland and she told me about the Urgenda case and this is something we can aspire to because I'm always hoping that it won't be mine by mine, coal seam gas well by coal seam gas well, <laughs> bird by bird, Aboriginal relic by relic. I, I don't think we've got time to do it this way. I, I thought at the beginning that would be the case. You know, wind turbine, wind farm by wind farm, each one a battle. How can it be like that? And I thought the law will decide it. Remember the Anvil case and Peter Gray? You know, we got climate as a thing that you can appeal to in the law. It became a, not retrospective for Peter Gray, but it was a thing that you could appeal to in the law. Well, it hasn't happened in Australia yet. We haven't had a law case yet where that has been the winning point. And I think it should be climate. The climate impact of this exported coal is dangerous and therefore we disallow it. That's what I'd love to hear a judge say and I hope it's coming. But anyway, in Holland it came, they took a case, they took the Dutch government to court and the Dutch government was um, told that they were not protecting the Dutch citizens 
and the unborn Dutch citizens from climate change by having too the, the targets were too low. And so they may appeal that case, but she came out here, Marianne Manessima, and she came out and she gave a lecture to her, and it was about, well, go through the courts. And that's rippling out across European jurisdictions now. So there's my um, experiences in the climate change scene. But I definitely urge you, you said, where to next? I urge you to consolidate. Don't just go to meetings where you're there as a token. You have to be part of the ideas of it. I don't like all these sort of get up rallies where it's just flag waving. I like to be there in the ideas and I, I wish we had more of that. And if uh, people in this room ca uh, can be part of organising that, some sort of summits that are really summits or getting together on the ideas because it's a huge battle. It's a huge thing to lift, to lift the culture. That's huge. But I think challenge the media wherever you can and challenge the culture. You know, these assumptions that are there, even as I said, among the farmers who are struggling to fend off a, a coal mine, they need to have a cultural change where they see, look, I've got to be in solidarity with these people who are actually really promoting our cause um, because climate change is our subject too. And um, connect with the world, the last one is. You know, connect with the world where, as Naomi Klein said, we need to have a Marshall <coughs> plan for the earth and it needs to be rolled out quickly. So thank you very much.